This video covers chapter six in our labor law book on union organizing. We're going to discuss the basic steps and the legal standards for how new unions are formed in the United States. We'll talk a bit about why individuals vote for or against a union in a representation election. We'll also understand the tactics used by employers to weaken individual support for unions and why these tactics are controversial. We'll also talk about the traditional tactics used by unions to strengthen individual support and the pressures for developing new strategies. We'll also talk about the pros and cons of the existing certification election process and mention a couple of options for reform. Suppose a group of workers wants to join together to influence the nature of their work. This could have to do with some kind of policy or procedure. It could also have to do with how the work is done and so on. As long as these activities do not interfere with their work, they are protected by law from reprisal. They cannot be fired, demoted, or disciplined for attempting to act as a group to affect the nature of their work. However, they can be ignored. Management has no legal obligation to deal with non-union groups of workers. If this group of workers is ignored, they can vote with their feet by looking for work elsewhere. They can put up with things just the way they are. They can be disruptive and attempt to pressure the employer, but the employer then may fire them, or they can try to form a labor union. There are several ways in which a union can be formed. Employees can initiate a strike and ask for support. This is called a recognition strike. They can attempt to strike to have the company automatically recognize a union. Union supporters could get workers to sign cards or a petition and present the results to management. Then management could voluntarily decide to negotiate with the union. Or, more likely, employees could have a secret ballot election in which the union and employer abide by majority decision. The third way is the most common form of how a union gets into a workplace. So how does organizing work? We'll go through each of these steps carefully. There's an initiation process, campaigning and filing an election petition, voting, and then the results. So this is a general diagram that describes the union organizing process. The union organizing process is how non-union workers are able to get a union to represent them in their workplace. The initiation of the process could begin by calling a recognition strike, but usually workers contact a union organizer in an attempt to get a union in the shop. It is possible also that a union organizer could contact the workers in an attempt to get the workers interested in a union. If the workers are going through the process to generate a secret ballot, once the union has been contacted, the workers and the union attempt to build support by collecting signed authorization cards. This is an example of an authorization card. I authorize the local union number, they would insert a number here, of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. The appropriate union would be listed out there to represent me, blah, blah, blah. The person would enter their personal information, sign the card, and submit the card. Once the workers reach 30%, they are allowed to file a petition with the National Labor Relations Board that asks to have an election. However, the union and the workers will continue to try to collect support and get more of the card signed. If the union happens to get more than 50% of the card signed, the workers can request voluntary recognition. Voluntary recognition would mean the company just agrees to begin negotiations with the union on behalf of the workers. They recognize the union as the bargaining agent for its workers. If the employer accepts that request for recognition, then they would begin to bargain with the union. The union would be recognized in the workplace and they would begin to bargain with the union. If the employer denies that voluntary recognition request, then the employees must still file a petition with the National Labor Relations Board. These authorization cards are evidence that the employees want a union. They're used as official evidence to the National Labor Relations Board and to the employers that the employees are interested in having a union represent them. 
If the employer chooses not to automatically recognize the workers' union, or the workers are only able to get somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the cards signed, then the workers in the union have to go through the petition and election process. If less than 30 percent of the cards are signed, the workers and union can continue to attempt to collect support, but if they don't reach the 30 percent mark, they cannot file a petition and cannot get an election. Once the petition is filed with the National Labor Relations Board, the National Labor Relations Board has several things to think about before they can approve an election. If less than 30% of the cards are signed, the National Labor Relations Board will deny the petition and require that the union and the company go back and continue to collect support. The National Labor Relations Board also has to determine, do these employees have the right union attempting to protect them? They also have to determine who counts as an employee that would be covered by the union and who does not. The National Labor Relations Board is also looking to see, has this set of workers had an election within the last 12 months? Typically, workers are only allowed to have one election per 12-month period. In the process of determining who can be covered by this union collective bargaining agreement and who cannot, the National Labor Relations Board has to carefully consider who can be considered a supervisor. Supervisors are not allowed to be covered by the union. Once the National Labor Relations Board has determined the appropriateness of the unit and that there has not been an election in the last 12 months, they may authorize an election. The elections are supervised and scheduled by the National Labor Relations Board. They usually take place on the employee's work site. Each eligible worker can vote using a secret ballot. Half of all elections are held within 33 days of the filing of the petition. Between the filing of the petition and the election, unions and companies are allowed to campaign. Campaigning is an attempt to influence the individual voting decision. The National Labor Relations Board expects that the election be conducted using what's called laboratory conditions doctrine or the General Shoe Doctrine. This says that in election proceedings, it is the board's function to provide a laboratory in which an experiment may be conducted under conditions as nearly ideal as possible to determine the uninhibited desires of the employees. This means that there are things that can be done in campaigning and things that cannot be done in campaigning by both the union and the employer. The National Labor Relations Board will look at the behavior of both parties to determine if they have met the laboratory conditions requirement. Employer and union campaigning is designed to focus on things like job satisfaction, perceived union instrumentality, meaning their ability to get things done, focus on general beliefs about unions, workplace social pressure and identity, and these things all go into impact whether a worker is willing to vote yes or no to support a union. Employer campaigning can include individual meetings with employees or meetings in small groups with supervisors. The supervisors are allowed to explain to the individual or group of employees why they think that they should not vote for the union. The company can send letters or email messages to workers laying out their side of the argument. Companies often focus on things like strikes, which decrease productivity and put workers out of work for a while. And they also focus on things like paying union dues. Companies are allowed to hold what's called captive audience meetings. Meetings at the workplace that occur during working hours in which employees are forced to listen to management's anti-union and pro-company presentations. There are two helpful tips to remember when thinking about managers and supervisors campaigning. FOE, facts, opinions, and personal experience. This is legal. TIPS, tips. These are illegal. Tips is threaten, intimidate, make a promise, or to spy on the workers. So facts, opinions, and experiences are legal. Threats, intimidation, promises, or spying are not legal. On the union side, unions can campaign to try to influence the workers to vote in favor of the union. Unions are allowed to promise that they will win gains for the employees. 
the employer must give the union a list of contact information after an election is scheduled. This allows the unions to contact employees or visit them at home. The unions can use websites and social media, but are not allowed to use the company's internal communication systems. The union may do things like mailings and handbills, which are more passive forms of campaigning. They may also do things like develop personal relationships with the workers via house calls and small group meetings. They may do rallies and solidarity days. They may use workers as volunteer organizers. These are more active methods for campaigning. There's a 24 hour time period in which neither the employer nor the union are allowed to contact the employees right before the election. If less than 50% of the people vote for the union, the union is not recognized and there is no bargaining obligation on the part of the company. If 50% plus one vote in favor of the union, the union is recognized and the employer must bargain. All of this is, of course, pending any legal challenges to the process. These could be filed on the part of the union or on the part of the company. As it stands right now, there are not a lot of penalties for companies that violate unfair practices in the campaigning process. This has led to a number of demands for reform. It's also led to some groups organizing outside the National Labor Relations Board certification process. The Employee Free Choice Act is just one of the measures that have been brought up as a way to solve those things. The Employee Free Choice Act would strengthen the National Labor Relations Board's power in ensuring the laboratory conditions. It would allow the National Labor Relations Board to provide for treble damages, treble means triple, and also allow them to get injunctions in the case of employers committing unfair labor practices. A criticism of this proposed act is that it would be based solely on card check recognition instead of allowing the workers to have a secret ballot. By removing the election process, informed employee decision-making is undermined because workers might not get as much information that they might have gotten through the campaign. It's important to know that unions can both be certified in or decertified out. A certification election is an election used in a non-union location to determine if a majority of employees want to become unionized. If the union wins, then the union is certified as the bargaining agent. A decertification election can also happen. This kind of election would take place where there is a unionized employees that no longer wish to be represented by a union. Most of these decertification elections result in a workplace going from union to non-union, though sometimes what will happen is they will vote out an existing union and certify a new union in their place. Some interesting statistics to share with you. Of all the petitions filed with the National Labor Relations Board, 85% of those are for certification. Only 15% are for decertification. So the majority of the petitions that the National Labor Relations Board sees are for certification purposes. Of all petitions, less than 70% actually get approved for election. On the certification side, less than 70% of petitions get approved for election 50% of these vote in a union, 50% of those that actually hold an election vote in a union. Even once a union is voted in, only 67% of the time do the workers who voted in a union actually get a contract. So you know me, I'm doing probabilities. What's the probability that we get a contract given that we wanted a union and a contract? There's only a 70% chance the petition gets approved, a 50% chance that a union gets voted in, and a 67% chance of a contract given that a union was voted in. That means there's only about a 25% chance that if I wanted a union and went through the process with the National Labor Relations Board, that I will actually have a union representing me in a substantial way. On the decertification side, also less than 70% of the petitions for elections are approved. When an election is approved, 67% of the workers vote to remove or change unions. So what's the probability of decertification or changing unions, assuming they wanted to? 
So 70% times 67% is almost 50%. So about 50% of the time, when workers are interested in getting rid of their union or swapping unions, they're successful in doing so. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you again soon.